Welcome to Understanding the Book of Revelation as Narrative. My name is Steve Meeker. This lesson covers chapters 10 and 11 of the Book of Revelation, the Mighty Angels and the Two Witnesses. Now, if you haven't looked at the first five lessons, I recommend that you go back and look at them because there is information in those that will help you with your understanding of lesson six. Thank you for joining us. The main reference for this study is a book called The Revelation of John, a narrative commentary by Dr. James L. Resigy. I've looked at several books uh, in preparing this class in this study. Uh, a lot of fine books on Revelation, but this one to me was outstanding. It uh, it spoke to me more than any other one that I had um, has seen. I think part of the reasons for that is, uh, first of all, Dr. Resigy has a, a doctorate in theology, but he's also extremely knowledgeable about literature. And he was able to pinpoint areas of the writing of Revelation that I've never seen anybody else do. And I think they're, they're very relevant in, uh, in our helping us with our understanding and appreciation of this beautiful book. And so I recommend that you get it for your library. But I'll give you a warning. Uh, this is the most, uh, probably the most scholarly book I've ever held in my hands. It is um, extensive in the references and footnotes. Uh, and um, you're not just going to sit down and breeze through it. So um, I'll tell you, it took me uh, probably several months to actually read through it. I could kind of handle about two paragraphs at a time and let those soak in before I went on further. But that's where we've developed this study from. And I'm excited to say that Dr. Resigy has collaborated with me on developing a study guide for this class that you can print. Uh, it's called Understanding the Book of Revelation as Narrative. And you can find it at www.academia.edu, either under Dr. Resigy's name or mine. I have utilized this uh, little graphic a few times to illustrate that Revelation is different from other books of the Bible, uh, where the majority of the books have a definite starting point, a definite ending point, and the action pretty much goes in a straight line chronologically. Revelation is all over the place concerning time and space. Sometimes it's way in the future, sometimes it's way in the past. Chapter 10 appears to occur during John's time as it was directly related to him primarily, although we can glean some information from it. Chapter 11 is more difficult to pin down. Some might say that it is a far in the future event. Others seem to indicate that it is perhaps even an ongoing event in current times. So we'll discuss that a little bit more as we get into chapter 11. As was the case with the seals, we experience a gap between the sixth and seventh trumpet. The embedded narrative of chapter 10, verse 1 through chapter 11, 14 opens a space within the storyline to assign a crucial role to John and to the church in the time between Jesus' death and resurrection and his coming at the end. The abrupt pause of rapid fire events draws our attention to the events that are drawn out and lengthened when the pace slows down. Just when the end seems to be right around the corner, John pauses, and Christians are reminded of their role in the story of Jesus' messianic rescue. And that's, uh, that last line might surprise you, the role that we have in Jesus' work. But I will remind you that uh, the gospel accounts of Jesus, when he went from town to town, if, the, if that particular town received him enthusiastically, he was able to do incredible miracles there. But in the towns where they did not receive him, uh, then he was limited in the amount of uh, signs and wonders that took place. And so a lot depends on us and our faith 
in being a part of his work in order for his work to be accomplished. So that's going to be seen more in chapter 11. Chapters four through nine, the setting has primarily been in heaven, but now in chapter 10, the setting shifts to earth and the time frame to John's lifetime. So Revelation chapter 10 verses one and two. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. So this is the second of three mighty angels appearing in Revelation. This one appears at the beginning of chapter 10. Mighty angels appear at crucial times in Revelation. If you'll remember back in chapter 5, verse 2, there was a mighty angel who said, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals? Here we have another mighty angel, evidently not the same one, that announces a thunderous in a thunderous voice that there will be no more delay. And then in chapter 18, verse 21, at the end of Babylon's destruction, a mighty angel throws a great millstone into the sea, symbolizing Babylon's fall from grandeur to destruction. So we want to pay close attention when the mighty angels show up. John relies heavily on similes and metaphors in attempting to describe this mighty angel. He was wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs were like pillars of fire. Once again, we are reminded of Exodus, where the children of Israel were led by a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. This also reminds us of the first chapter of Revelation, where John had this vision of Christ, and also of the throne room with the rainbow uh, that was uh, seen around the, the one seated on the throne. This angel of a new exodus guides the new Israel on its wilderness pilgrimage out of Egypt, or in this case, Babylon the Great, to the new promised land, the new Jerusalem. I want to talk a little more about the angel before we read the next verses. The mighty angel takes an unusual posture standing with his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. This is repeated three times in verses 2, 5, and 8. Colossal dimensions of the angel correspond with the importance of his message. It's a message of universal importance. The angel has a little scroll in his hand. This is slightly different, but uh, similar to the scroll in chapter 5 that appeared in God's hand. Both scrolls contain the purpose of God for the world, but the scroll of chapter 5 contained God's plan as carried out by the Lamb, whereas the little scroll contains God's plan carried out by John and by the church. So now let's look at Revelation chapter 10 verses 3 and 4. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voice of the seven thunders spoke, and when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven say, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. When the angel speaks, the seven thunders awaken and speak. John doesn't elaborate about who or what the seven thunders are. But many scholars speculate that there could be another series of judgments like the seven seals and the seven trumpets. With a two-step progression, a voice from heaven commands that the, the thunders be sealed up and not written down. One possible explanation is that the divine judgments have proven ineffectual in convincing the earth's inhabitants to repent. Author Richard Bockham, quoted in Dr. Resigy's book, states, whereas the trumpet plagues hardened the hearts of the rest of human, humankind, the testimony of the faithful church leads to their repentance, which we'll see in chapter 11. 
Revelation chapter 10, verses 5 through 7. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, There will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servant the prophets. So the angel raises his right hand to heaven and swears an oath by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, and the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it. The angel accentuates two of God's fundamental traits, God is eternal and the creator of the entire cosmos, heaven, earth, and sea. Furthermore, the rep uh, repetitious phrase, what is in it, means that all, without exception, the rebellious and the repentant, and even the beast himself, are created by God. In chapter 10, verse 6, the angel announces that, quote, there will be no more delay. Now, if you recall back in chapter 6, verse 10, the souls of the martyrs who were under the altar, that sub-altar means under the altar, ask, how long? They're told to wait a little longer. With the thunder sealed, however, delay is canceled. Nevertheless, the end is not just around the corner. We are becoming attuned to the rhythm of God's timing and ways. Time lurches forward, then slows down, and then speeds up again. The end seems near, but is postponed until God's purpose for all creation are accomplished. Perhaps you might have experienced this in your own spiritual life. You have several things that you're concerned about that you are praying for, and you might be praying for quite a long time, and it might even appear and nothing's happening. I'm praying and praying, nothing's happening. And then suddenly, the floodgates open and everything happens at once. Suddenly there's ma a major moves of God in your life in various areas, and all of a sudden you're rushing just to keep up. And then things slow down again. That's kind of the way it is with God's timing. The angel continues his oath in verse 7. But in the days when the seventh angel is to blow its trumpet, the mystery of God will be fulfilled, as he announced to his servants the prophets. The mystery of God pertains to the means by which God will achieve his goal, which was revealed in chapter 7, I'm sorry, chapter 11, at the seventh trumpet. A testifying church brings about the conversion of a rebellious world. Revelation chapter 10 verses 8 through 11. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once again. Go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. The heavenly voice speaks again and commands John to take the open scroll from the angel. When John asks the angel for the scroll, the angel gives him the odd instruction, take the scroll and eat it. Eating a book is symbolic of devouring a message and making it a part of oneself. There are some examples in the Old Testament. Look at Jeremiah 15:16. When your words came, I ate them and they were my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. So eating the word means making it a part of who you are.
And notice that in verses 9 and 10, we have another chiasm. We mentioned this before, powerful expression that follows kind of an A, B, B, A pattern. Uh, here in verse uh, 9, it says, talking about eating the, eating the scroll, it will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. Then in verse 10, it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. So how can a message be bitter and sweet at the same time? In his book, Dr. Resigy offered a few ideas. For John, it's sweet that proclaiming the message of salvation is a delight. However, it is bitter and that it involves a message of judgment. Not all are going to respond to the call of salvation. God's word is often described as sweet as honey. In fact, Psalm 19 verse 10 states that. It also could mean that it is sweet that there is going to be no more delay in the fulfillment of God's plan. It can be bitter because the church will face intense persecution and even martyrdom as a result of proclaiming God's word. For John, the persecution that comes from a rebellious world brings pain and suffering. For those who receive the word as a message of salvation, it is sweet. But for those who reject it, will experience judgment as bitter. In chapter 10, verse 11, it reads, Then I was told, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Well, remember that by this time, John is quite old. He's likely in his 80s. That's old for these days. It was especially old for his time. You might think that he deserves to take it easy now, but chapter 10 ends with John being told that his work was not over, that he must continue to prophesy about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So there's no such thing as a spiritual retirement plan. As long as we're on this earth, we are to continue working for the king. Um, this is not in the Bible, but it has uh, been passed down through Christian tradition. Uh, it is a true fact that in 96 AD, the Roman Emperor Domitian was killed in a coup. And the fellow that took over him, after him was the Emperor Nerva. And one of his first acts was to free all political prisoners. And so that was in 96 AD. It is believed that John was released from Patmos at that time and that he did continue to prophecy about peoples nations languages and kings for several more years before his death we don't have hard evidence about that but that has been passed down to us through christian tradition so we'll take it as that so that brings us to the end of chapter 10. revelation 10 is a story of the role john plays in God's drama of redemption. Revelation 11 will tell the story of the church's role. Christ's victory depends for its earthly completion on Christians eating the message. Revelation 11 expresses a major theological theme, the paradox of a community safe from harm, yet subject to danger, secured by God, yet trampled by hostile forces. It uses parables, parabolic images, in fact, to, to develop this uneasy paradox, making this chapter the most difficult, yet the most important in the whole book of Revelation. That's a quote from Dr. James Resigy's book. Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2. I was given a read like a measuring rod and was told go and measure the temple of god and the altar with its worshipers but exclude the outer court do not measure it because it has been given to the gentiles they will trample on the holy city for 42 months so john is given a measuring rod and told to measure the temple of god the altar the worshipers, but not to measure the outer courts. 
The act of measuring is an important gesture that determines the appropriate boundaries of a space or activity. The portion within the limits represents spaces, a space in persons that are protected by God. It is holy space. The unmeasured portion is handed over to the nations to trample for the symbolic period of 42 months. This reminds us of Ezekiel chapter 40, where the temple was measured to determine what belongs to God and is under his protection. We've mentioned this a couple of times before, but elsewhere in Revelation, the temple is always figurative, not literal. And this temple seems to be no exception. You remember in the letters back in chapter 3, verse 12, the conquerors in Philadelphia are promised that they will be made pillars of the temple of God. A temple made of human pillars is not a physical temple of stones and mortar, but a metaphor for the saint's relationship with God. Similarly, the temple in 11.1 is likely an image for the community of believers and their relationship to God. So the saints are the temple, and yet a portion of the temple remains unmeasured and subject to physical harm, the outer court. This appears to be a paradox, for the imagery of measuring sees the church from the point of view of a spiritually protected community, whereas the imagery of the court trampled views the church from the perspective of a physically vulnerable community. So how can this be? How can you be protected and vulnerable at the same time? Well, like the martyrs, being sealed or measured for God's protection does not mean that Christians will be shielded from suffering and even death, but that they are stamped with the sign of God's security, even if they have to die. Their souls are protected and belong to God. The physical bodies may suffer. Now look at verse three. And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. We're going to talk about the witnesses a little bit more in just a minute, but let's first of all talk about the time periods here, 42 months and 1,260 days. And so we have 42 months and 1,260 days, both of those representing three and a half years, but to different groups of people. Now, some of you are probably thinking, wait a minute, 1,260 days isn't quite three and a half years. It's a few days short of that. In Roman times, the number 360 was generally accepted as the number of days in a year. They knew it was really 365 and a quarter. They had good calendars, but the number 360 was rounded off as uh, representing the year. It also represented anything that's round. That is why we have 360 degrees in a circle based on the Earth's movements around the sun. Or they might have thought the sun was moving around the Earth, but in other words, based on the number of days in a year. So we have 42 months and 1260 days, both representing three and a half years. Well, three and a half years is a broken seven. The complete and perfect seven is split in half, symbolic of the in-between times that, we, that are fractured until they are repaired by the Messiah. The paradox of the in-between time is that the period of distress in which the church is subject to harm corresponds to the time set aside for the church to fulfill its prophetic task. Persecution and protection, witnessing and opposition are two sides of the same coin during the symbolic period of a broken seven are three and a half years. Think about the Acts, the book of Acts, as the uh, apostles were out moving and speaking the word. There was a great, um, great crowds that came to listen to them. Many people accepted the words. Many people rejected them. And wherever they went, there was opposition. And so these things operate in a balance. Uh, we as Christians will face opposition as we express and live out our faith.
All right, Revelation 11, 3 and 4. We just read three a minute ago. We'll read it again now. And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. I have heard many people develop their ideas about who they believe the two witnesses are. Most commonly, you hear people say they are Moses and Elijah. Well, they certainly do contain characteristics of those two Old Testament prophets. You hear a number of different ideas, uh, but I believe that the ideas expressed here are more exciting because they include the church. The paradox of a vulnerable yet protected community of believers is developed by the image of the two witnesses. They represent the faithful church in its specific role as witnesses for God. In other words, the two witnesses are you and me. Now, think about it. If we're talking about Moses and Elijah being the two witnesses, then what are we doing? We're just standing around watching the action. But if we're the two witnesses, then we are the action. We're part of the action as Jesus works through us. They contain elements of Old Testament prophets. The outward clothing of the witnesses represents the nature of the church's prophetic witness. Sackcloth was worn during times of mourning and also was an outward symbol of repentance. The two witnesses put on sackcloth and, uh, to mourn the spiritual condition of the peoples of the earth and to call them to repentance. And you might recall that in the Old Testament, two witnesses are required to provide valid testimony. Important imagery involves the lampstands and the olive trees in verses 4. As olive trees are a plentiful source of oil for burning lamps, certainly was in that culture, so the two olive trees supply the lampstands with an abundant supply of oil. Thus, despite the hostile threat from the outside, the church's witness is in no danger of being extinguished. Now we're going to develop this a little bit further. In the Old Testament, kings and priests were anointed with oil. That is, oil was smeared on their head in a special ceremony to signify their new calling or duty. You can see that in 1 Samuel chapter 16 when Samuel anointed David. In the New Testament, Jesus himself and his followers are said to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. Look at this quote, verses, um, uh, John, 1 John chapter 2, 20. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. Thus the metaphor of the olive trees supplying the lamps with oil are a reference to the Holy Spirit supplying us with the power that we need to carry out God's purpose in our life, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Revelation 11 verses 5 and 6. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. So verses 5 and 6 remind us of Moses and Elijah. We mentioned them a few minutes ago. Elijah called down fire upon his enemies and shut up the sky. Moses turned the Nile into blood and also brought about numerous plagues. The fire coming from the witnesses' mouths is a colorful way of describing the forceful effect of their words and deeds. It also reminds of the sword John saw protruding from Christ's mouth. Evidently, they are forceful speakers. So let's go back to what we were saying just a little bit earlier. If the two witnesses represent the church, if they represent you and me, well, we have a great deal of power at our disposal. Through the Holy Spirit, we need to learn to tap into it.
Revelation chapter 11, verses 7 through 10. Now when they had finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, for also their Lord was crucified for three and a half days. Some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who lived on the earth. Okay, we have a lot to unpack here. And so let's go through it kind of slowly in detail. Uh, a protected and powerful church is still vulnerable to hostile attack from the outside. The witness's pattern of testimony and opposition is a fundamental expression of the nature of Christian witness. Where the gospel is preached, opposition follows. We've seen that from the very beginning. The inhabitants of the earth, those who make their home on earth and identify with its culture, are hostile to God and the Lamb, and their point of view is earthbound. They gloat over the death of the two witnesses. They celebrate and exchange gifts because the two witnesses had been a torment to them. Not everyone is going to be happy with the message of Christ. Even people in your own circle of influence, when you talk about the things that Christ has done for you, not everyone is going to accept that gladly. From a below perspective, it appears that the beast and its followers triumph. But from an above perspective, the testimony and death of the witnesses represent the counterintuitive way God triumphs in this world. Victory through death. Oh yes, we should probably mention the beast there. Uh, this is the first time that John refers to the beast, uh, but we will see him uh, further developed in chapter 13. In verse 8, we find the first of eight references to, quote, the great city. In the other seven, it's always associated with Babylon, and that is likely the case here, even though it references where also their Lord was crucified. Now, there have been some people that believe that this is referring to Jerusalem, uh, but it's not likely Jerusalem because the description is spiritual, not literal. Jerusalem is never called Sodom and Egypt. Babylon the Great is the city that spiritually crucifies Christ and enthrones the beast. In Revelation, there are only two cities, the New Jerusalem, which represents the kingdom of God, and Babylon the Great, which represents the anti-God culture of this world. And so when we're looking at the great city, we're talking about Babylon the Great, the anti-God culture of this world. Babylon the Great's other spiritual traits are represented by Old Testament locations of degradation. Sodom is a symbol of wickedness, and Egypt is a place of slavery and alienation. Babylon the Great is the opposite of the other symbolic city of Revelation, the New Jerusalem. The two symbolic cities represent the two opposing points of view of Revelation. The New Jerusalem is the place of harmony, order, and peace where God and the Lamb reign, whereas Babylon is the city where God is mocked and followers of the beast celebrate the triumph of evil over good. The corpses of the two witnesses lie in the street for the symbolic period of three and a half days. Another broken seven appears once again. But now in terms of days, not years. The church's life and work is symbolized by the number three and a half. The broken seven describes the essential character of the church in the in-between times. It's an authoritative and powerful voice within society, but it is also beaten down, trodden upon, and killed. Revelation chapter 11, verses 11 through 13. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. 
Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, while their enemies looked on. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The earthquake destroys one-tenth of the city of 70,000 people. The number 7, the number of completeness, times 10, the number of totality, times 10,000, is part of John's symbolic numerology, meaning this city represents the complete and total earth. One-tenth of the earth is destroyed, but nine-tenths are spared destruction. This is a surprising reversal of, of numerous Old Testament judgments where one-tenth is spared and nine-tenths are destroyed. Now this is where I think the image of the two witnesses representing the church, representing you and me, is so exciting. You see, the nine-tenths were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. All this time, after all the judgments and plagues and horsemen and everything that we've seen, people got stiff-necked and would not give God the glory. But now, that's changed. What caused the change? Well, it was the witness of the church that was necessary in bringing about the repentance of the world. For the plagues alone are ineffectual in moving humankind in the right direction, the testimony of faithful believers is effectual. When judgments are combined with the church's call to repentance, the results are positive. The Christian's voice is instrumental in the conversion of the nations of the world. May I suggest to you that the most powerful words you can ever say to anyone at any time are, Can I tell you what Jesus has done for me? Your witness is powerful. Revelation 11, verse 14. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. You remember the eagle that came out in, in uh, chapter 9 and gave the three woes? Well, now here's the second one. The second woe was not complete until the witness of the church awakens humanity to repentance. But John's statement that the third woe is coming soon is a warning that the opportunity for repentance is rapidly drawing to a close. The third woe, while not actually enumerated, occurs in chapter 12. We'll see it in the next lesson when a loud voice announces woe on the earth. Revelation chapter 11 verse 15. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord, and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. The seventh trumpet finally sounds after nearly two chapters. And this is in verse 15. Loud voices in heaven are heard singing praise. The celebration in this scene is the announcement of the transfer of sovereignty of the world to God and his Messiah. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah. The cosmos is restored to proper order, and the chaos of the counterfeit is dispelled. While the earth was once the dominion of a usurper, it now passes into the hands of its true owner, God and the Lamb. Revelation chapter 11 verses 16 through 18. And the twenty-four elders who were seated on the throne before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth.
And so in verse 16, the 24 elders add their voice of acclaim as they worship God. Now the phrase, the Lord God Almighty, occurs seven times in Revelation. Not a coincidence, as seven is the number of perfection and completion. However, the familiar phrase, who was and is and is to come, has been changed now. It's been supplemented by who is and who was. No longer who is to come. So this is a strong indication that God's coming has now occurred. Revelation 11, 19. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the Ark of the Covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. Okay, chapter 11, verse 19 begins by telling us God's temple in heaven was opened. We've said this before, there's not an actual physical temple in heaven. John comments on it later on. So when we see this phrase, God's temple, we're talking about the place where God dwells, not an actual structure, not an actual building. Um, in, we're seeing also the repetition of an important marker that occurs throughout Revelation, and each time it becomes more intense. Back in chapter 4, verse 5, we saw a threefold manifestation of God's presence that included lightning, rumblings, and thunder. Then in chapter 8, verse 5, the manifestation is lengthened to include an earthquake. And now here in 1119, it's lengthened once again to include heavy hailstones. So we're getting more intense as we go through Revelation. In addition, an interesting reference is made to the Ark of the Covenant. In the Old Testament, the Ark was kept in the temple. It contained the Ten Commandments and was the instrument for God's judgment. The appearance here may be symbolic link to the judgment of God that is about to fall on Babylon. Yet the end is not here. There are still 11 more chapters to come. In chapter 11, John's vision, he sees the powerful witness and the impact of the church in the two witnesses. The church is then struck down but revived after three and a half days and called to heaven. The earth's people give glory to the God of heaven. Then Christ return to claim sovereignty over the earth, the transfer of power after the seventh trumpet. I want to thank you for tuning in to this lesson, lesson six, chapter 10 and 11. You might want to go back and re-listen to parts of particularly chapter 11. I know we've presented this from a different angle from what you normally hear, but I think it's a very exciting way of seeing this vision and that it involves us. Prayerfully consider what we have said here today. And once again, I'm Steve Meeker. Tune in next time for Lesson 7, which includes the war in heaven.